need to know that God is real. And I speak that as someone who didn't you really used to believe that. <laughs> I didn't. I mean, as a way to as a way, way to kind of set up what I'm going to talk about today. So I, I grew up in upstate New York, and and um, and actually the beginning of my college life was at a community college, and then it was at the State University of New York at New Paltz. When I went to Dutchess Community College in in, in the, the Hudson Valley, there, uh, you know, there was a professor, a Russian professor, and he his parents had escaped the um, communist revolution and had come to to the European side, and so he came to the United States. He was a teacher, and at this point in his life, he was sort of retired, but he would teach at a community college. But he had he had some bitterness in him and. And I remember, and, and, but he was a gifted teacher, and from him I got a real love of history of, because of what he taught. But this is what he did when we walked in the first day. He sat us down, took chalk in his hand, went to the blackboard, which was really green, blackboard, and he started doing this and scribbling and scribbling until the whole board was full of scribbles. And he said, what is that? And he said, That! is history. This is, what he, this is what he told us. That is history. And his point was, he believed that if God is real, he's not involved. Now, you know where he's coming from, right? His parents barely escaped with their lives. Others that he knew and loved and they knew had died. And he believed that God was not in charge. That's what he believed. And so even though I had been raised kind of in a Catholic situation... And because he was such a good teacher, I kind of believed that. So, you know, when, when you see people on the streets and so on today, young people, cut them a little slack. Pray for them. I mean that. Because that was me years ago. But here I am. And in fact, what brought me to faith in Jesus Christ, to know that God was real, has to do with prophecy. A prophecy in the Bible used to be kind of a silly word or a dirty word or whatever in my mind because after all, Christians were crazy. You all know that. <laughs> and yet it's very, very important because only God can predict the future because only God is outside of the time domain. He can see it all. He sees the end from the beginning. And so when I became convinced that was true, the Bible did predict the future I decided that he was wrong, that man was wrong, and that God, this, was right. So, let's jump in. We'll give a little introduction, then we'll have a little prayer. Shall we do that? All right. I want you to look at a picture. What is that? What do you think? That's right. Very good. Very good, bombed out Europe. That is what much of Europe looked like right after World War II, because World War II, of course, involved you know the, the fascists. The, there were fascists in Germany and Italy and Spain, and then there was France and England and the United States and Russia. And it's all, and so, uh, needless to say, Europe desperately needed help right after World War II. Who was it that helped build them, rebuild them? The United States of America. What was the name of the program that the United States implemented right after World War II, whereby hundreds of millions of American dollars were voluntarily spent to help rebuild Europe? Very good. It was called the Marshall Plan, named after this guy, President Truman's Secretary of State, George Marshall. He designed it and implemented it. What was the result of the Marshall Plan? All right, see now, now you need to wake up now. <laughs> because of the Marshall Plan and then NATO, which kind of came out of it, and then the European Union, which came out of that, all of Western Europe, so Western Europe doesn't include the Eastern states, right, Poland and so on, Czechoslovakia, Western Europe, all of Western Europe would now begin functioning as interconnected states, all with a democratic form of government. That's important because democracy had not been the way that Europe was ruled since the Roman Empire, really. Think, think about it. So you had, had the Romans and you had sort of the Holy Roman Empire. You had city-states. You had and then eventually kings, remember? 
kings and so on, and you had Napoleon and Charlemagne and all those guys. So Europe, even though democracy, if you will, came from Greece and the, the, the French kind of did some stuff in England, England was a colonialist, king, you know, kings and so on. Europe was not, but what happened with the Marshall Plan? What did we kind of say to them? Hmm? Well, guys, if we're going to give you our money, you're going to do things our way. And so just like that, all of Europe was pressured into being democratic in, in the sense of democratic forms of government. So as a result of the Marshall Plan and then NATO and then the European Union, the result was that for the first time, the territory, Western Europe, the territory of the old Roman Empire had again become one connected entity, but this time different from the old empire, they were weak and not strong. They were, they were partially weak and partially strong. So we're doing a series called America in Prophecy. And the name of this sermon is called Enabler of Rome Reborn. Enabler of Rome Reborn. So before we go any further, let's pray, shall we? Lord, you say that your words are spirit and they are life. That you're the God of heaven and earth. And that all things will happen as it has been written by the prophets. Lord, you rest your case to show the world of who you are and what you intend to do on the writings of your prophets and apostles. And so we pray that today... We would not be partly strong and partly weak when we leave here, but that we would be stronger than we ever were before, knowing that you hold time itself in your hand and that all things will take place according to your wisdom. It says in your word that you cause all things to work together for good, and it also says that you, that you hold history in your hand. Worketh all things to the counsel of your own will. Let that be clear to us today, Lord, as never before, that we might be strong. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, first of all, does anyone remember my bowling pin analogy from last week? Let me see if I can summarize it for you. American Christians should understand that the Bible gives predictions describing how the, quote, bowling pins of the bowling alley of time and history will be set up just before the second coming of Christ. But it also should be understood by American Christians that America is not specifically named as being one of those bowling pins. However, American Christians should also understand that the 10 pins, and I believe there are 10 things, Ten pins that the Bible does name specifically are only there today thanks to the United States of America, I call God's pin setter. Okay? This is so profound that we are forced to conclude that God must have founded America for that prophetic purpose. Remember the squiggles on the, on the board? That's a lot of, you know, pinball machine. You know, the odds of this hitting that and so on. There are so many links in that chain. So many interconnected things. So many moving parts. It is absolutely impossible for the God to say, okay, here's what the bowling pins are going to look like just before the second coming. And all the stuff that needs to happen to bring that about starting from individual lives to, to waves and, and trends and power. It's impossible for all that to happen and to have one nation that's responsible for setting up all of them, nine out of those ten, after World War II. Did you hear what I just said? Out of those ten, nine of the ten were set up by the United States after World War II. Set up. I am forced, I'll speak for myself, I am forced to conclude that we have to say, that must be why there's an America. 
That, that must be the whole reason why we're even here, to have that kind of power. Therefore, we should all have prophetic patriotism. Say it with me. Prophetic patriotism in our hearts, which is what? A desire to preserve America so that we can have July 4th parades, July 4th day parades. Why? So, so that we can have Disneyland? So that we can march around and feel proud of ourselves because we're so cool? We're so big and bad? No, so that it can fulfill that prophetic purpose until the second coming. So, continuing with my bowling pin analogy, if you remember from last week, what were the first two pins that had to be set in place before Christ's return that have actually already been set in place by America? Well, first, there had to be a safe haven for Israel dispersed for the Jewish people Again, if you read that one book that I found, which is called Israel's Final Holocaust, it's a Jack Van Impey sort of, it's a really easy read. It chronicles all the persecution of the Jews. It'll shock you to your core. There was only one, one, one place that they could come. And as George Washington wrote in his letter to the Jewish congregation that asked him the question when he, when he became president, is this going to be the same thing? He said, no. Our constitution guarantees your right to worship and that the children of Abraham in this country shall be under their vine, under their fig tree with no one to make them afraid. God has blessed America because God has been a, quote, friend to the Jew. Not by chance. There had to be a place. So number one, there had to be a safe haven for Israel dispersed. It's called the diaspora. But number two, there had to be a defender of Israel reborn. We talked about it last week. Truman's president. We're the only ones with the atom bomb. He'd had a good friend, his best friend, Mr. Jacobson, who he'd been in business with during the Depression. Israel decides to declare that they're a, they're a nation, that they're a new nation, that they're coming back after the Holocaust. We're going to be a nation again. We're going to be Israel. And everybody in the world is angry, just, just incensed. Except for who? The United States of America. And so on that day, Truman says, you know what? We recognize Israel as a reborn nation, sovereign nation. And there was nothing that anyone could do about it. Because at that time, there was no one else with what? The atomic bomb. That timing is not an accident. So the first two pins, there had to be a safe haven for the Jews. There had to be a, a defender and protector of a newborn state of Israel to usher in the last days, to usher in the final act of the play. The first two bowling pins. Now, what are the next two bowling pins we're going to look at today? <laughs> well, according to the Bible, just before Christ's return, there also has to be a reuniter of Rome reborn, of the old Roman Empire, and a democratizer of Rome reborn. And we're going to talk about why both of those are important. But first, what do we mean by Rome reborn? <laughs> so this is a map of the old Roman Empire. Hopefully you remember it from your school days. Its heyday was approximately 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. And believe it or not, its rebirth, so to speak, is coming. And that's what we're going to talk about. But to better understand today's lesson, we need to go further back in history to another empire that came before the Roman Empire called the Babylonian Empire. So here's a map of the Babylonian Empire. And in its heyday... That was between 605 B.C. and 539 B.C. That's when it, you know, Babylonian Empire. So its first ruler was a man named what? Anybody? King Nebuchadnezzar. Here he is sleeping. He's having a very disturbing dream. He is so disturbed. He wakes up. Rubs his eyes, calls his advisory council. And they're made up of wise men, conjurers, magicians, diviners. You see, in the old 
empires of that part of the world, when you were a conqueror, you would go into each conquered territory and you'd find their best and brightest, hopefully those that could do magic, occultic, black arts, that sort of thing. Because you want to have those guys around you. Right? You kind of want to know what's coming before it comes kind of thing. You want, them to, you want some people that are able to be magical for you. So, the, by the way, they conquered because of disobedience of the Jewish people to God. God said, I'm going to exile you to Babylon, and they were conquered. And, and the best and brightest was, well, the, the house of David, the different priests and so on, and they, they dragged him off to Babylon. So he, he gets up off of this dream, and he, he gathers his uh, brain trust, <laughs> and he says, you know, I'm going to test these dudes. I, I'm going requ- to make sure that what they're telling me about this dream is really true, magically true. So he demands that they tell him first what the dream was, because if, if they're really who they say they are, he, they're going to be able to know, right? And then tell them what it means. And of course, they can't do that. <laughs> That's, they can't. And so he decides in a huff that they all it must be worthless. He's been wrong. I don't care what the tradition is. These yes men, and that's what they are, they're just yes men. Oh, you're, you're just great. Oh, dear emperor. They're yes men. They're worthless. And I don't want to pay their meal ticket anymore. In fact, I'm going to kill them all. I'm going to kill you know, I'm sick of them. I'm so upset. So he calls his commander, a guy named Arioch, and to go throughout his kingdom and find all these people and put them all to death. And unfortunately, you know, Daniel wasn't in the room when he's first saying it, but Daniel's going to die, as well as his other Jewish friends. But they pray. You ever been in a situation where you think this is it? This, we're done? No hope? What should you do? You pray. <laughs> so they pray. And lo and behold, what happens? So Daniel goes to sleep. And he, and he gets up and he, said, and he literally says, and he means it, Oh my God. And we say it, then we don't mean it. He meant it. Oh my. And so he calls in Arioch, this guy, and he tells his friends, hallelujah, they kind of have it pray, praise fest. He says, we got this, we got this. Tell the king, we got this. So Arioch says, oh, good. So he goes into the king, and he tells uh, the, the king, you know, uh, that, you know, we got, we got a guy, we got a guy. So let's pick up the narrative, Daniel chapter 2. Here's what it says. Book of Daniel 2, 25. And Arioch, the king's commander, hurriedly brought Daniel into God's presence, into king, the king's, king Nebuchadnezzar's presence. And he said to the king, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can make the interpretation of the dream known to the king. Then the king said to Daniel, hmm, it's not in the, <laughs> it's probably what he thought, who is called Bel- Belteshazzar. That's interesting. Bel is, he tries to ne- rename all, Bel is a Babylonian god, B-E-L. So he tries to rename Daniel, which I believe means God, God will be my judge, God is my judge, Daniel, E-L is the, the Hebrew uh, tag for, for the God of Israel. El Shaddai, L-L-E-L, Daniel, right? God is my judge. Belteshazzar, I believe, means Bel protects or Bel something. Bel is this pagan god. So he says to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar, who he, he had named Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream? So he's making sure that you get the deal here, right? It's not just, you're going to tell me the dream and the interpretation, which I've seen and its interpretation. Daniel answered and said, the mystery about which the king has inquired has shown you that neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners all these occultic guys, are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. It is he who has made known to you, King Nebuchadnezzar, what will take place in the latter days. So this was the reason for your dream and the visions in your mind. For while you were on your bed, your thoughts had turned to what will happen. So he's, he's saying, look, this is what the deal was. You're in your bed. You're wondering what's going to happen in the future. It will take place in the future. And so he revealed it to you. He who has revealed mysteries has made known to you what will take place. So he's, he's giving him even the context. This is, where, this is where you were going in your mind. As for me... This mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me, 
more than any other man, but in order to make the interpretation known to you that you might understand the thoughts of your own mind. You, king, here, he's, you, know, you, king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. So here's, a, here's sort of an illustration of Daniel's explaining and the king's bringing it back to his mind. And we can only imagine all the wise men in the room desperately hoping that Daniel gets this right. Let's continue. The statue was large and of extraordinary splendor. It was standing before you and its appearance was awesome. The head of the statue was made of gold. Its breast and arms were of silver. Its belly and thighs were of bronze. Its legs were of iron, but its feet were partly of iron and partly of clay. So here's the statue. So you might think, well, why would God do this? God is going to show us through this situation. He has shown Nebuchadnezzar the empires that have something to do with Israel. So there's lots of empires in the world, not just these that he's going to describe. But these are the ones that have to do with Israel because Israel is God's clock. Israel is what's called in the Bible the navel of the earth from which everything else comes. And so God has a good reason to show. Why? Because the Babylonian Empire is the first time that the Gentiles are going to be in charge over Israel. So God had established Israel. And now we're going to have these Gentile empires. And so it kind of makes sense that you start with this first Gentile empire king, Nebuchadnezzar. It kind of represents the pride of mankind. Let's keep going. We're going to focus on the feet made partly of iron and partly of clay. Daniel says, You continued to look until a stone was cut out without hands, which means without human, uh, was not the work of humanity. It came and struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. So here's a picture of what, you know, that's talking about. Here comes the stone. <laughs> Cut out without hands, not, not of human origin. And so let's continue. Then the iron, clay, bronze, silver, gold, gold were all crushed at the same time, which means all the kingdoms of men will be dissipated at that time. They became like chaff from the summer threshing floor and the wind carried them away so that no place, no trace was found in them. So we've talked about this. Remember what the threshing floor is in, the, in Israel? You find a hill. You make it bald. No offense to anybody who's fo follically challenged. You make it bald. And then you gather your wheat, put it on your cart hauled off by a, the ox or something, and you wait your turn. So when it's your turn, you go up on the threshing floor, you spread out all the, the stalks with the wheat on it, all on the top, right? You start at the middle and you make circles like this until it's all spread out on the threshing floor. And then you take your ox and your cart and you start in the middle and you, and you just crunch it down, crunch it down, crunch it down, crunch it down. And you do it again and again and again until you think you're not okay. So all the wheat now, the kernels have separated and they've fallen to the ground. And you take your winnowing fork which is like a pitchfork with a shovel type thing on the end. You start at the middle and you scoop and you throw it up in the air. So what's going to happen? The wheat falls at your feet, but the wind, that's what it's talking about, takes the chaff, that's the stalk, and blows it to the base of the threshing floor. There it goes. Start in the middle, keep doing it, keep doing it, until you thoroughly purge your threshing floor. That's what John the Baptist said Jesus was going to do. So what this is saying is, you know, all these empires, just chaff for the wheat. God's going to use them to raise up his people and the wheat will fall at his feet and the chaff will be down there. And what do you do with chaff when you're done? What did they used to do? You gather it up and you burn it in the fire. 
right? So, so suddenly, here comes the stone. Crack, crack. All the kingdoms of men become like chaff. Useful for a little bit for the harvest. But when the harvest is done, gone. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and it filled the whole earth. Hallelujah. You know, I used to think Christian preachers were silly when they kept saying hallelujah. Now I say hallelujah all the time. It means praise the Lord. So anyway, for those of you who agree, you have to cut me some slack for saying hallelujah. It just kind of comes out, you know, just kind of comes out. Hallelujah. <laughs> king, this was your dream. Now, we will tell us interpretation of the king. Okay. <laughs> so all the other wise men are going. They're impre- at this point, they're impressed because the king's eyes are real big because he's, he's there. He knows. He, okay, he's got this. But now comes the real test, right? The interpretation. Because Daniel has got to get this right. It's got to make sense to the king and it's got to ring true to the king so that they all cannot die. So they're shaking and quaking and, okay, Daniel, come on, come on, come on. So Daniel kind of keeps going. He probably took a breath, right? He said, you, king, are the king of kings whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom and the power and strength and glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell or beasts of the field, birds of the sky, he's given them to you. He has called them. He's caused them, you, to rule them. So you are the head of gold which is to say the Babylonian Empire. After you, remember, king, you're wondering what's coming? All right, listen up. After you will arise another kingdom inferior to you, which is very interesting because it's the Persian Empire, Medo-Persian Empire. The Persians were stronger than the Medes, two arms like this, right? It's just perfect. Two arms. This one's a little stronger, but they're both there. The Medo-Persian, inferior to you, Then a third kingdom of bronze will also rule over the earth. So the Persian Empire is the silver here, and the empire of Alexander the Great is the bronze. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron. It's the Roman Empire. Insomuch as iron crushes all things, so like iron it will crush and break all of these. In other words, this one will be more brutal, stronger. The, 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 the Roman, what's the word? The Roman ethos, the Roman, they, they were a martial people, martial philosophy. A might makes right. You, you, you show no mercy. You give no quarter. They, they, they were more brutal than all the others. They, they would capture and enslave immediately. They, they ruled with an iron fist, if you will. Iron, literally iron. And, and the fact that they used crucifixion should tell you. That's like the most cruel and brutal way to put a man to death. So what, what does that kind of tell us? All these empires are really the work of who? Of the enemy. We, when, you, when you're talking about crushing and brutal and crucifixion... They're really, it's really the work of the enemy. That's why, that's why Satan offered all the, quote, kingdoms of the world to Jesus when he tempted Jesus, remember? I, I'll give all this to you. The statue is really the pride of man, history. It's really the work of the enemy. Let's keep going. Just as you saw the feet and toes, partly of iron and partly of clay, it will be... A divided kingdom. The key phrase is it will be because that means it eventually will be because the old Roman Empire was not divided like that. Now, you notice the two legs. There was an eastern and a western. Isn't this amazing? God's. There was an eastern and western side of it, but it was never, quote, divided. No way. You know, the roads went everywhere and the emperors ruled completely. But it will be a divided kingdom. So let's, let's kind of take a pause there and review this thing. So, so here it is. Here's the, here's the picture. Showing the empires. Now keep in mind that it is conveying a passage of time. Right? From top to bottom. So first you have the top, 
And then with the passage of time, you have the next. And with the passage of more time, you have the next. Passage of more time. So that by the time you get to the feet, you've gone through a great long length of time. It's important. Now, from our perspective, from, from where we sit in 2020, the strong and united legs of the Roman Empire are in the past. But the divided, weaker, iron and clay feet of Rome to come, the Roman Empire to come, is yet in the future. So Daniel now, this is very important. Actually, hopefully all of it's important. But what I'm about to tell you speaks to us in our time now. So let's see. Because Daniel's going to spend some time on the feet of the statue. Let's continue. The divided kingdom, right, the feet, will, ha- will have the toughness of iron in so much as you saw the common clay mixed with iron. Just as the toes were partly of iron and partly of clay, some of the kingdom will be strong and some will be brittle. Just as you saw iron mixed with common clay, these will combine with one another in the seed of men. So in the seed of men confirms that we're talking about general population. The seed of men. What you're seeing is the seed of men. Some strong, some weak. They will not adhere even as iron does not combine with pottery. Because pottery is clay is how you make pottery. So these ten toes, so to speak, will function together but will still have different cultures. Different languages. They won't adhere together. All of Rome spoke Latin. The old empire. It will be in the days of those kings. Whoa. Daniel just said the ten toes are ten kings. As in ten leaders of ten nations. In the days of those kings. It will be in the days of those kings that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will Never be destroyed. And there's the stone that that came to smash it, right? That kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Insomuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands... In other words, by God himself. And that it crushed the iron, bronze, clay, silver, gold, all of man's empires. The great God has made known to you what will take place in the future. And so the dream is true. And its interpretation is trustworthy. So the scripture goes on to say that Nebuchadnezzar was so impressed that he actually did homage to Daniel, promoted Daniel, made him a big muckety-muck guy within his empire, and actually put him in charge of all these wise men. And that's how we know, it's a whole other sermon, that he, the libraries that he kept were responsible for the writings of the Jews being preserved so that on Christmas Day, some wise men from that part of the world could come and say... Where is he who is born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east from the prophecies in the Old Testament. And we've come to worship him because he will be God. That's how they know. So that's free of charge. That's an add-on. So I set that aside. Here's the question. What is the role that the United States of America would be playing in the eventual fulfillment of the feet portion of Daniel's prophecy. Here's the answer, but again, I'm going to use my bowling pin analogy. In God's prophetic plan, the United States was always destined, first of all, to be the reuniter of an iron Rome. Remember, the feet have both iron and clay. And I just explained all that to you about the Marshall Plan. After World War II... It looked like that was impossible. But then here comes the United States. So the United States was always destined to be the reuniter of an iron Rome. 
with their money and their influence and their power. And if we're going to give you our money, you're going to do things our way. You're all going to be interconnected. Our, our Washington, D.C. is not going to deal with, with all these different bureaucracies. No way. There's going to be the Marshall Plan. There's going to be NATO. There's going to be, and it finally became the European Union. Why? Why? This is so cool. For the purpose of biblical reciprocity. Because you might be asking, well, there's lots of empires. Why Rome? There's the Chinese, the Mayans, and the Incas. So it could have been it. Ah. By biblical reciprocity, we mean that the principle of reciprocity is actually found throughout the scriptures. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, given it shall be given unto you with a measure that you meet, it will meet it back to you again. Reciprocity. In this case, Christ died at the hands of Rome, and now Rome will die at the hands of Christ. You hear what I just said? Cosmic payback. That's so cool. That's so cool. So the second pin. The democratizer of a common clay, right? So it's going to be iron but common clay. Common clay speaks of the common people. It speaks of democracy as being part of the way it all gets run. Why would the United States also be destined to be the democratizer of a common clay room? Why? For the purpose of a world government template. What I mean by that is that this reborn Roman Empire will be the model that a nation that enables all the nations of the world to finally sort of figure out how to function as one entity. So God destined the United States to be the one to force that so that the other could happen. Only the United States of America enabled this. Both of today's bowling pins, so to speak, the strong Rome altogether and the common clay Rome, only happened because the United States enabled them to happen. But what about the big stone that was cut out of the mountain without human hands and you know, the one that's supposed to come and smash the feet and fill up the whole earth? Here's how we understand that, I believe. Let's look at something that Jesus Christ said to his disciples, which I believe is going to tell us what's meant there. So let's go there. We're going to go to uh, the Gospel of Matthew and the background for this passage is that it happens at a place called Caesarea Philippi. The word Caesarea comes from the word Caesar. Caesarea Philippi. City of Caesar Philippi is what it means. Now, there was this Roman puppet king named Philip the Tetrarch who happened to be the, the son of Herod the Great. Remember the one who the wise men came to and said, where's the king of the Jews? And he got mad and he wanted to kill all the children. So that guy has a son and this guy... Philip is his son, Philip the Tetrarch, for the northern part of Israel. And so he is sort of kowtowing to Rome, the Roman Empire. And he made this city a headquarters for the administration of Rome over the Jewish people. You see, you see where I'm going with this? This city. But, he, but the city, he called the city Caesarea, which means the city of Caesar, but it became known as what? Caesarea Philippi. Because Philip had been the one that built it up. So it became known as Caesarea. The city of Caesar, Philip. Philippi. So let's read. Now when Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he's asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? We told you what son of man means. Son of man to the Jews meant 
ordinary man, but when Daniel saw a vision of the Messiah coming out of the sky, taking over the world, he, he surprisingly said, and he looked like a son of man. He looked like an ordinary man, and yet to him was given ruler over the whole earth. And so from Daniel, from that point on, the Messiah, one of the names for the Messiah is the son of man. And so Jesus called himself the son of man and the son of God. Okay? So Jesus says, who do people say that the son of man is? So who's he probably thinking of? What's he probably thinking about when he says, who do people say that the son of man is? He's probably thinking of Daniel, the prophecy of Daniel, probably. I think it's a pretty good assumption. And they answered and said, well, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still is Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So Christ means Messiah, Son of the living God means, and, and that, that dude's going to be divine. You are the Messiah, and by Messiah, I mean the Son. I mean God in skin. You are the Messiah, and by that, I mean God in skin. That's what he's saying. The Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, means son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, hope you're listening. So Jesus has Daniel in mind when he says son of man. He has in mind that they're in a Roman administrative city. He has in mind that all believers are going to have this faith, this, this statement of faith. You're the Christ, God in skin. And what does that tell us? It means that the rock of, quote, Jesus is the Christ, son of the living God, is the same as the stone destined to fill up the earth. So it has two meanings. It's Jesus himself. Remember the, the cornerstone? But Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus said, on this, you're the stone, and on this stone, I'll build my church. The word in the Old Testament is Hebrew, stone, the word rock in the New Testament is Greek, but they both mean like a boulder. It means like a, doesn't mean, you know, I got a stone in my shoe. It means this. The rock is the stone. The stone is the rock. That means that along with Jesus himself, we are Daniel's stone. Collectively, the church with a capital C. So let's bring this thing home, shall we? What's the name of this church? I know you say, well, there's a hymn. Yeah, but what's the hymn based on? This. Isn't that interesting? And what is, quote, solid rock church supposed to be doing right now? We are supposed to be getting wisdom from God on how to defeat the enemy. Feet. F-E-E-T. Defeat the enemy. Defeat the enemy. You know why? Because first you have to defeat the enemy before you can fill up the whole earth with the gospel that Jesus is God in skin. The gospel that Jesus is God in skin. So what is, what is the gospel again? Come on, say it with me. Three, six, John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So I had that history class 
And I didn't believe any of it. And then God, by his mercy, flesh and blood didn't reveal it to me. I'll tell you that right now. God did something in my heart. He had me read actually a book called The Late Great Planet Earth, which talked about this. And the premise was, now, if God's in charge of all of history, then he really is God. And there really is a reason that you're in this world. And that is to defeat the enemy. And so I gave, you know, if that's, and, and in order to, you've got to be the rock. You've got to follow the rock. You've got to have him be the head of the church. Your shepherd. Does a shepherd lead from behind? No. Did Jesus say, you know what? You go ahead and I'll tell you where to go. No. He said, what did he say to Peter, James, and John? He said, follow me. Follow me. That's what he said. So if you're thinking, well, gosh, you know, Dominic, if, if all that's true, then the reason I can go down to, you know, Walmart and Costco and so on, and we're so blessed, is because God raised up America to do all of this. And if I'm part of America, then I need to have prophetic patriotism. I need to pray, God, just fulfill God's purpose in America. Fulfill God. And what is America if not all of us? That means God, fulfill God's purpose in America. Fulfill your purpose in me. So if you're there today on cyberspace or here today and, and you've never really said what Peter said, you can just do what I did years ago. You can pray that prayer. You can just say, Lord Jesus, just say it with me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of the living God, that you came to die for my sins. You came to take the punishment I deserve for my sins. And you rose on the third day to conquer death so that I could also live forever together with you in heaven. I believe. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, by your spirit. Live your life in me. And I'll do the best I can to live for you and serve you all the days of my life. Jesus, man. In Jesus' name, amen. And there's one more thing. So after I went to college, I became a solo tenor at a church there in Poughkeepsie. And one day, who do you think walks in the back door? My old Russian professor. He had become a Christian. He was beginning to fill up the whole earth starting with Poughkeepsie. Why not starting with Blissfield? Amen? Amen. Amen.